in the title of this uh, press, this session, uh, we called it Weavers of Time, and I put this subtitle, The Possibility of Time Freedom. <clears throat> so I wrote, we are weavers of time, we do this freely, but we have been weaving unconsciously, and so we trap ourselves in our own nets of knowing. And what do I mean by this? It means that at any given situation, we arrange the events, we arrange, anticipate some kind of narrative is going to happen in a certain structure. And uh, in that video, you see there's different structures in which time is allowed or not allowed to um, function. Um, and so, um, as Gebser talked about, we have this possibility of time freedom by um, understanding that we're always building, we're always composing frames and structures for the way um, we organize events inside this structure of what we call time. Just like the directors were doing that intentionally in the films. Okay. So most of you know there's two words for time in the Greek language. So chronos refers to chronological time, the spatialized sequence spread out across a line. It has the aspect of quantity and measurement like ticks along that line. And we have this kind of illustration here that shows the burden of having to be in that kind of time. Kairos has a qualitative aspect to it, which refers to a proper or opportune moment. So looks like this something is imminent. She's looking away from time, uh, moving at an opportune mo moment. Um, but Donna Haraway introduced me to a third notion of time called Kainos, which she describes as the now, a time of beginnings, a time for freshness. She writes, nothing in Kainos must mean conventional past, present, or future. So we have this illustration where she seems to be able to um, slip slightly away from time itself. And then uh, we have Gebser's notion, which goes even beyond this of time freedom, is being aware of time as an activity of consciousness. And so that we do this unconsciously, but we can become conscious of this activity and conscious that we are organizing events or organizing reality in a certain way. So here's one way that physicists have organized uh, reality. And um, this is a composite view of the universe um, from, um, here's our galaxy and the observable solar system. And as you look back anywhere from the universe, um, you're looking further and further back into time. So here is when the galaxies formed, and here is when the plasma starts um, forming more, more um, denser material. And here's just the plasma, and that back here is the cosmic background radiation. And so what's interesting about this um, is a map of time and events in time. Um, but in this spherical universe, um, every point, it's not like, you know, every point that you are in, um, you're in the center of this time, time map. And the question that I pose is, um, if you're here in the center and you're looking back at the past from any place in the universe, then where is tomorrow? If everything that is observed is expanding away from you from the point of observation in the past, then where is tomorrow? So this is an interesting question that leads to um, innovations in physics. Okay, so here's an innovation in the sense that here is the point of observation, which is any point in the universe, which is all points are centers. And as we look back, we see what I just showed you. We see the expanding universe where the farther you look, the farther back in time you go. And here in this direction, what you see is you have a field of infinite potential that is keeps coalescing into the present moment. So you have this kind of isomorphy between potential, infinite potential states in the past 
that are aggregated by a, um, an, an observer or an agent or a, uh, that was a, a nexus of history. And then when you look out, um, you see everywhere you see is increasing um, distance in the past. Okay, so this brings us to a conclusion uh, that's consistent with um, Stephen Hawking's final theory of uh, the origin of time. And that is to um, consider that the lens we use to look back in the past toward origin and the lens we need to look forward to the future are different. So we actually are compositionally oriented in two different ways. When we look toward the past and when we look toward the future, when we look back at the past and we look at the future, we are compositionally by our mental models, by the, by the tools we use that at, you know, our mental models ask the question, the question builds the tools, the tools then observe events, but the, the actual orientation that we are when we look and ask questions about the future and when we look and ask questions about the past, are two different lenses. The past is of necessity fixed and concretized, and the future is of necessity open, contingent, and free, which is why we need two different lenses. It would be like trying to look at the stars with a microscope and trying to look at an you know, uh, amoeba with a telescope. We need two different lenses. We need two different compositional orientations because we are looking at different kinds of functions or operations. Reality unfolds from dynamic states of open possibility. So these are open possibilities, but it's composed when we look out at the past of retrospective occurrences or prior occasions. So this is Whitehead and this is a positive Whitehead in contemporary physics. Retrospective accounts are selective and discontinuous. So when we look at the past, we see things, we see entities that are discontinuous because they don't contain the interstitial field that weaves the pre-occurrence relationships together. So here, when it, and the unfolding future here and tomorrow, this contains a lot of interstitial fields, all the relationships that are threatening to appear but not have yet not appeared. And once it becomes concretized into the past, those institutional relationships are no longer observable. So then we see discontinuity. And this is the two different compositions that we, we manage, that we uh, orient toward. So, so when some of the threads, when we're looking at the past, don't survive the concretization, they recede as the occasion secedes from the background in order to succeed from the prior occasion. It's very similar to the way your hand, um, um, your hand develops as a fetus. At first, the hand has some bones, but there, it's, the spaces between your fingers is all tissue the institutional tissue. And then as it develops, the, the, the tissue in between is lost and then you get discontinuity. But at certain point in the, there was, prior to the hand becoming a hand, this, this overlapping of continuous continuity. So the effects, this is very whiteheading, and the effects that are realized fix their causes retrospectively. So it's not until this there's a bunch of causes here. If this and this and this align together, then they become cause of this. But if this, this, and this, and this relate, form a relationship, then they cause a different effect. So only when it crosses this threshold um, are the, the effects uh, fix their causes retrospectively. This constitutes a causal gradient in which both potentials and actuals are infinite, but not exhaustive. Realized effects are real, but not specifiable. Fixed causes are specifiable and true, but not real. They're not real because they leave out the causal relationships that are lost in the interstitial uh, field. Effects leave their mark on the causal record. 
The question of free will or determinism therefore is no longer a question. The universe advances freely, but each advance fixes the causal chain retrospectively into the story of an actual occasion, giving the true but not real impression of determinism. So it's a true in the orientation looking back because the causes get fixed, but it's not real in the unfolding future. The story, any story we tell is a reduction and an abstraction, i.e. a subtraction of the field of possibility prior to the actual occurrence. It is that field of open possibility, the interstitial causal tissue that does not survive the causal record, which is subtracted from the story of occasion coming into being. Now, that's a lot of concepts. So I'm going to give you a feeling of this. This is the causal, these are all Aboriginal paintings. This is the causal field, whether you have some, some things threatening to appear and it's all filled with interstitial uh, relationships. The whole field is buzzing with potential, okay? And from this unfolds, um, the moment which gets concretized. And so from this, certain relationships persist and we might then see three beings dancing. And what you can see here is you can still see the interstitial background is still there, but now has changed because the moment has concretized these beings into existence. When we look into the past, we would not see the interstitial. In between, we would just see the three beings dancing. But then if we look back toward the future, I mean, back toward the future or turn around and look toward the future, we can start to see the dance of the causal relationship. Some people call this quantum mechanics. Some people call this the wave function. That's the dance toward that which has not yet been observed. And then this back and forth gives you the sense of what is happening in time um, between the orientation toward the past potential, I mean, past actual and the future potential, which is a weird way of saying it because the potentials in a different thing are also in, from a different perspective, are in the past. Okay, so hopefully uh, that gives you some idea of what I'm talking about. Here's an another rendition. Um, if you stop this, Whoops, ah, if I stop this GIF in a certain way, you can see this is the torus that we looked at before, um, but it actually has uh, this more of this sweeping um, three-dimensional uh, universal space-time feature to it. Um, and this one on the right gives you a sense this of the, you can see that the, um, the past is, is flowing in at, at us. So the, the, earl, the later past is here and the future is uh, unfolding into the past that we see. And so these are you know, people trying to give uh, some kind of um, representation of these very, very complex, multi-dimensional, multi-dynamic um, properties. So um, this is a way of um, constructing weaving time. Um, in Hawking's final theory, what he says is very interesting. So I said, we have these lenses and we use two different lenses. And he says, actually the lenses themselves evolve biologically through agent observer planetary dynamics. This is his huge contribution to the book that his uh, interlocutor wrote after he died, um, that the lenses themselves have evolved in time, um, which orients, which allows us to weave time um, in different ways over time. And this, I think, is a, a very uh, prescient uh, rendition of time in an Aboriginal drawing, because um, it's a map of here's the observer, and the observer is in the present, and he looks back, he, he's the intersection looking back toward the past and looking toward the time, the observation, the observer sets the shape of time as a past present phenomenon. Okay.
That's it. Thank you, Ivo, and thank you, Benita. Um, I guess I don't really have a question. It was more just riffing that your your presentation provoked a number of um, associations, and I, I just wanted to bring up um, Alan Lightman's book Einstein's Dreams that that has some sort of narrative play with uh, different I, you know experiences of time that you might you might. Um, you might enjoy, or just, you know, some of the folks here might enjoy. And then um, you brought to my attention Jenlin's uh, "What First and Third Person Processes Really Are" paper, which I found staggering. And the specific thing is, well, there's a lot of it, but the forward-looking possibility seems to connect very st strongly with the implicit and the implicit understanding, as he articulates it there. I don't know. So there's, I think, some interesting material, and then. Um, the last thing I wanted to put onto the conversation is Stuart Brand um, has this notion of pace layering as a way to think about civilization and different rates of change. And that's a little more sort of structural and ontological than experiential, but I feel like, um, well, okay, uh, frankly, like looking around at the audience here, we tend, to, we're, we're, we're skewing a little bit older and that maps to his conception of um, the older an individual is in their life cycle, they tend to become more and more interested in the slower changing layers of things. And I think, uh, you know, turning our attention towards the nature of time itself is uh, perhaps an example of that. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. This is wonderful. Yeah, those are great comments. I'll just um, piggyback on Jen's like, yeah. So the question is, what is, what is the instrument? What is the lens we use to, uh, to see the future, that that gets you into Jendlin, uh, very much Jendlin like conversation. It's it's a uh, it's a, you know it gets you into Norbatens. It's in the in between. It's the context. It's the field. It's the numinous causality. Um, what we can do as scientists or uh, as philosophers, as Whitehead does, I mean. Well, James was able to attend to the experience of time. Whitehead seemed to be more, have a more speculative imagination, but we can, ref, we can infer from the lens of looking at the back at time retrospectively, what must be the field from which the potentials arise. But also Gendlin would propose, as would William James, is that the body, attending to the body can give you this direct experience of what it's like to lean into or, or what is the lens of the future. And the first comment we had from the, the first woman um, was also uh, kind of expressing that, that she could feel that there was this temporal order that was being exchanged and rechanged and, and whatever. Um, so yes, uh, great, great, great um, comments. Okay, Olga, you're next, then Mark, and then Joan. Hi, Bonnie. Um, yeah, thanks for this. Uh, I'm gonna have to watch again because I I missed a bit, and also. I don't know, I'm wondering if my own sort of mild background in mathematical physics is actually messing with my head and I'm not understanding a lot of things. But I wanted to ask, like, looking at your, you had this image, this indigenous kind of art thing, with uh, which I loved. Um, but I was trying to understand if there is an implication from what you said, and I'm sorry if this is dumb, but like, is there an implication that the concept of an object somehow becomes a little bit looser? Like, like the thing that I am looking at somehow becomes a bit of a more fluid thing that maybe if I change my perception, I can start looking at it as, as if it's not there. Like if I, is there any way in, in which this follows from what you're saying? Like, and if that's true, like, is there any kind of practice that I, as a person who is very used to seeing things the way I just see things since I was born, that I can actually, I don't know, work on kind of getting a different perspective on time? I don't know, does it make any sense? <laughs> no, it makes perfect sense. You're definitely on to exactly something. There is this phrase I use, it's there and not there at the same time. Okay. So. Uh, if you were looking at 
uh, a um, you know we a synthesized element in a lab that had a half life of half a second. You would you would experience that it's there and not there at the same time, right? Because it comes and goes into existence really fast. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at a mountain, you don't. It's hard to experience that it's there and not there at the same time. If you have children and you have a certain dispositional state, you see them growing up so fast. You're like, well, where did my baby go? And then you start to look at them, and the one you're looking at is there and not there at the same time. And then you can start to really enter into what is more true about reality is that things are there and not there at the same time. And then you can start to see that you think things are there or not there, that it's a duality because of the way you arrange time. And then you can start to really expand your structuration of your, your mental model of time and um, and you start to play with this. Now, I'm just gonna say this because that's also the definition of a pure abstraction. It's there and not there at the same time. Um, the self is a pure abstraction. It's there and not there at the same time. So this thing, this insight, this idea you're playing with gets you very far um, that, um, that, yeah, so, um, you know, and I use a lot of times just the example of my pond, which is a beaver pond. It used to be a forest and then the, with a river running through it. And then the beaver dammed the river and then it got a, was a flooded forest. And now slowly but surely, we used to fight against it. It's, it's silting back up and the shrubs are starting to grow. And I'm like, is it, it's no longer, when is it not a pond? And when is it going to be? There'll be a forest again someday. I mean, the beaver pond is there and not there at the same time. Mm -hmm. And you start to really stretch out, like instead of having this like little thin piece of linear time, you start to realize that it's got this much more fabric to it that you can actually inhabit. Okay, last question, Niels. Thank you, last one, Niels. Uh, I've been thinking about through this session, uh, when do we perceive time and when do we not perceive time? I think I think that when things are moving, then we perceive time because it will progress in some ways. If there's no movement, there's no need for time. So we don't we don't perceive it as time. Uh, what do you think about that? <laughs> no, I think that um <clears throat> This may be the very definition of time. Um, and um, and it's similar to some of the, the conundrums that the physicists are, are um, delving into. But one of the things that just as a practical, if people want to come away with this and doing a practical, and that is um, if you want to experience the fabric of time at a um, different level, you need to remove chronos from your, from your life. Um, so if you have a job and it's time stamped and you have children and it's time stamped, you got to get here, you'll never be able to experience this. But if you have the luxury of being laid off or lose your job, or some of us when we were in COVID and you wake up in the morning, you have nothing to do, nothing that's calling you to do, the sense of complete openness. Then you start to realize what time is versus how you've been weaving time uh, as a construct, a narrative construct all the time. So I often work with coaches who are busy, 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 busy people. And I tell them you can't be effective uh, because you coach other people who are busy, busy, busy. And you need to find 40 hours in your week to free up. And they're like, 40 hours? I can't free up 40 hours. And I'm like, yes, you can. You're only constrained by the way you are weaving time. So um, I know this is 
true in the in the relative and practical world. So it's a good, great, great uh, comment to end on.